In a series uh, which I've titled Jesus Among the Other Gods, where we've looked at uh, idolatry and how the gospel overcomes that. And any of you who've been in the series for the last couple of weeks, I hope you're starting to see uh, that I'm trying to show you uh, that the world is indeed full of monsters. But these aren't the monsters of old or, or myths, but these monsters do wreak and reap havoc in our lives and in the lives of people around us. But these monsters are created from us. They're the byproduct of our choices. They're the result of mankind's incorrect worship. And when we understand this, when we understand that this is overcome by Christ and the gospel, that we start to see a different role for us as Christians in the world. We, in a sense, are idol uh, exposers. And that's the goal. That's what I hope to get to at the end of this series. Now, as we dive into the fourth week, we are going to look at two idols that reap hellish, even uh, horrific consequences in the reality of the world around us. Before we get into that, let's just recap for those of you who haven't been part of the series. Basically, we're going through a series uh, through Galatians, and Paul in this um, Galatians passage identifies sins in the world, these acts of the flesh that he calls them, are simply an outworking of what we worship. The word he uses is this, uh, uh, this Greek word epithemia, which means over desires. It's what we over desire creates worship and that worship, false worship, creates these acts of sin. Paul's argument essentially is that we worship created or temporal things other than the true God and this creates the evil that we see in the world. See, we weren't created to worship these things and these things weren't created to be worshipped and that's why chaos ensues. It is this idolatry that is causing the evil that we see around us. This week we're going to look at two Greek idols again, two Greek gods, because it's appropriate. That's when this time was written. I could have used any other god, but it's just illustrative at this point. We're going to look at Zealous, the god of jealousy and zeal, and Lyssa, the goddess of rage and wrath. These two realities intertwine and link together, and in fact are somewhat connected to what we looked at last week. And so we're going to look at them again. We're going to look at this reality of what causes, what are we worshipping when these realities come out. So with that in mind, let's read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 to 20. It says there, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the epithemia, the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, and factions. Tonight we're going to, may the Lord bless the reading of His Word, but tonight we're going to look at these two words, jealousy and fits of rage. These are the two things that we're going to identify what causes them, uh, what do we worship in the underlying reality, and then how to disarm that power. So the powers that we're going to look at are two Greek powers. I've mentioned them before, Zealous and Lyssa. So that's our first point. Zealous and Lyssa. Who are these? These are well-represented gods in the Pantheon. Parthenon, Pantheon, whatever. Um, that uh, are not really worshipped in a sense, just like last week, but are, are written, written extensively about... Zealous himself is one of Zeus's guardians and behind many battles. Lyssa is a primordial goddess, what the Greeks would call a daimona, a goddess of the old order before the Olympians. There's not much written about how to venerate them and, and uh, worship these gods, but a number of stories are intertwined with their involvements. In a sense, the Romans and the Greeks understood that these were subtle characteristics. Zealous and Lyssa are assumed uh, deities. 
ever lurking behind other powers. And last, like last week, it'll be difficult to parse out what is meant by worshipping them. And so tonight we're going to ask the question, what is being pushed up? What good thing, what creative thing is being pushed up to the point of deification? What are we worshipping when we sin by, zealous, uh, by jealousy and rage? Now let's think about this. What are jealousy and rage? They're almost explosive emotions. I don't know if you've picked this up in your own life, but no one like works towards jealousy or works towards rage, right? These things come over us in fits. I mean, we have um, uh, anachronisms about this. We say the green-eyed monster, right? Because it feels like suddenly something else has controlled you and you are just jealous to the core. Or something does some, someone does something and uh, it's like you are overtaken by rage, right? I mean, we have stories today in our society of road rage where the people walk away and say, I wasn't there. It was like an out of body experience. So these are almost, in a sense, we can see powers that work on us, not the other way around. It's almost that someone gives themselves over to these things and they become fully possessed by these realities. Now let's look at something. Is jealousy and anger a bad thing? The Bible never condemns these as bad in themselves. Think about it. I mean, the God, uh, the, the God of the Bible describes himself as what? I am a jealous God, O Israel. And in fact, this is a good thing. In fact, I encourage any married couple to not be jealous of the covenant relationship that they bring. In fact, um, wives, a little bit of uh, pastoral counseling tonight. If someone comes up and hits on you, you know, like, you know, starts making eyes and starts t sweet talking you and your husband there and says nothing, you need to get into counseling. <laughs> like right there. What should the, the natural, healthy, good response of a husband be? To step in. Now let's reverse that. Husbands, if your wives see a lady come and give you eyes and, and she says nothing, get into counseling. Because the same applies, right? Jealousy is good. You should be jealous of close relationships. You should want to protect them. God is jealous. What about anger? Well, anger is good. It's good to be angry when things are wrong. God himself has righteous anger the scriptures say do not sin in your anger and we know we know intimately well where jealousy and anger start to manifest themselves as sins i don't think we need to go into any kind of psychological babble here right now to kind of expose that we know these things we know when jealousy and zeal and wrath have overtaken us and it become problems. And so the natural emotions of zealous, uh, jealousy, zeal, and anger become sins when we are overtaken by them. When they overtake you. When in a sense they are unleashed. And so let's ask the question tonight. What are we worshipping when these sins become manifest? When anger moves to sinful anger, when jealousy moves to sinful jealousy and obsession. Well, this leads us to our second point, I before you. Unrestrained anger and rage and jealousy are fundamentally, if you think about it, worship of yourself. Now, I'll justify this. The Bible is clear about this, I think. Uh, in James chapter 4, we read, and I think this is such a great verse. Just keep your ears picked for some certain words. What causes, so this is James chapter 4, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you do not get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Do you see jealousy and anger and wrath? You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you might spend what you get on your pleasures. I think it's clear what James is arguing. What is the reason you fight and rage and are jealous? You. 
Now, those of you who have been concentrating through the series, uh, let's see, the astute students, would have picked up a word tonight, right? James uses the word desire. And when I saw that, I got all excited. I'm like, oh man, there's a pattern. Another desire. Let's go look into this. So I got excited, got my Greek uh, text of the Bible open, and started to read it and got thoroughly disappointed. Because it's not epithemia. I know, right? I was like, pattern, amazing. Ah, oh, thumb. But I was actually enthused. I was actually more excited when I discovered what the word was. So what is the word that James uses here for the word desire? Well, in the Greek translation, the reason for the division and the fighting is the word he uses is hedonon, where we get our English word hedonism from. Hedonism, of those of you who might not know, hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure. That human beings exist. It's the idea that we exist for the pursuit of happiness and pleasure. Think about it. What causes the fights among you? What causes jealousy? What causes the problem? You exist for you. What causes the explosive rage or the unrestrained jealousy, the unbridled zeal? What is the cause of all these evils? It is simply the worship of self. It's the pursuit of you, your feelings, your happiness, your meaning before all others. In all of this, you are deifying yourself. You are worshipping you. Now you might be thinking that's absurd. Only the most narcissistic person worships themselves, right? I mean, we all know those people. My, my, my late father-in-law used to call them eye specialists. Not because they were specialists in the eye, but whenever you talked about something, they would say, but I've done this. You know, you've had those stories where you're telling the story and like, well, well, I've done it and that's even bigger. That's an ice That's a narcissist. That's someone who's obviously obsessed about themselves. But how do we, you know, good Christians, people who come to church on Sunday night, the saints among saints, <laughs> straight after lockdown, I must admit, you know, you who are hungry to start up uh, evening services, how do we worship ourselves? Surely we've moved past that. We're humble. We're, you know, we, we look at others better than ourselves. But if you think about it, it's actually quite obvious. Look at your hopes, your securities, your significance in the world. Do you build that? Is it around and orientated around what you do? You see, when we think about it, the worship of self actually might be far more prevalent than we first thought. When it comes to it, we live our lives according to what? Our ability, our capacity, our actions. That determines our life's direction. It's what we can do that matters, that builds our lives. And what have we done there? We've made an idol of me. Because my life depends on who? No one else but me. I built my life. I achieved. Me, me, me. Now, what's the danger in that? What is the problem in that? Why is that destructive? Well, think about it. What happens when life doesn't go according to plan? When you are in control, when you do everything right, when you make all the directions and decisions in your life, when everything comes to you and it doesn't go according to your plans, what happens? What did I do wrong? Why me? Why aren't those people getting my bad luck? You start seeing it? Jealousy, starting to overpower, and right behind it, on its heels, rage, anger, disappointment, and what explodes out? That. That explodes out because it's unfair, right? Having your own self-interest as the core reality of your life is fundamentally idolatry. And therefore it's destructive. But, who here tonight doesn't live their lives like that? Who doesn't live their lives with, you know, I need to do stuff. 
And you aren't it? I mean, most of us play the game where we say, you know, I'll trust God, but I'll take the next step, right? Or like you do something and it's really good and you're like, no, no, it wasn't really me. The false modesty, you know, it's really just God, really. We all live like that, right? We all fight with the, the self that is tripping ourselves up. How do we overcome this idolatry? Well, this leads us to the third point, picking up our cross. Paul in this passage that we've been going through week by week is encouraging us to live by what? The Spirit. He's, and elsewhere he says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. And we'll see at the end of this series that the result of walking by the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. It's a gift. It's given to us. It's the outwalking of spiritual walking. And here's the point of the passage. We live like this because of over desires. We are idolatrizing the wrong things. We are worshiping the wrong things. Why? Because we are not living in the Spirit. We are living in the opposite of that. We're living in the flesh. This helps us tonight. This opposite. Because what overcomes our selfishness, our self-worship, if we're honest? The Spirit. Being full of the Spirit. Now, many of you might be thinking, this sounds like spiritual nonsense. Right? But let me read a verse and then I'll get into it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 to 29. It says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. In fact, that's a continuous command. Be being filled with the Spirit. Always be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing uh, and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Giving thanks always and for everything to God and uh, the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, notice that the command to be filled with the Spirit is connected to the command to submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. And we have to be careful here. Because right now you're saying, okay... I think I'm getting the picture. I think I'm putting the puzzle pieces together. So we mustn't obsess our lives and do, do, do. We must trust God. We must walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit, must, we must be filled. It's our job to be filled. And the way we do that is by submitting to one another, right? You've just missed it. You've just done the exact opposite of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. What do I mean by this? You, I mean, you might be saying, but the verse is telling me to be filled with the Spirit. Surely that's my job. The verse is telling me to submit to one another. That's my job, right? And here comes the annoying part of the Christian message. Yes, that's your job. But it's not what you do. It's not up to you. The gospel flips it around. It says it's a result of what Christ has done. That's what the gospel is. Now think about this. Often we want to do something in order to change, right? I mean, when last have you been caught in a, an unhealthy pattern and what is the thing that you do? Give me the five steps that I need to do to get out of this. Give me the pointers. Give me the life hack so I can escape this problem. And do they work? Well, sometimes. But I would say, often, they open up worse things. So you might overcome the sin of, say, um, I don't know, anger, but replace it only with the sin of pride. Because who's still in charge of fixing you? You. You. You are trying to do something so that you stay in control. Essentially, you want to keep yourself as God of your life. You don't want to let that go. In fact, I would say most of our sins tonight, we don't give up because we don't want to give them up. We like them. What do we hate about our sins? Their consequences, the guilt, the fact that we could get caught, the fact that they could ruin our lives. That's not hating the sin. What is that hating? The consequence. Guess who you're still loving? You loving you. You know, the old statement, find someone who will love you as much as you love you. you know? 
you still want to be in control. You still want to make all the choices. You still want to be the chief player in your own life. Now that is idiotic. That's like trying to put out a fire by adding more fire. Or, or if, in, like, trying, to, trying to fix a tap by turning it on harder. What are you doing? You're just adding more of the problem to the problem, right? Now if your problem is you, you doing more stuff, what's that going to do? Mess up things faster. Which generally happens, right? How many of us, be honest, have by all our stressing and planning and manipulating and, you know, doing, 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 twisting so that the world works out into our favor, how many times does that end up opening up things that are far worse than if we had just left it alone? Right? If we had just said, you know what, it's okay. We'll get through this. I just need to do what's in front of me. No, we don't do that. We don't just do what's in front of us. What do we do? The 500 things that are not in front of us, and we assess about that, and we make sure that our life goes its right direction. And we mess it up. The message of Scripture is clear. The problem in your life, church, is not other people. It's not the system. It's not your parents, as Freud would like us believe. It's who? It's you. You are the sinner. You are the one that keeps on messing up your life. You cannot solve your problem because your problem is you. You need help. And here the cross becomes the answer to our obsession with self, church. You see, it's, it's the cross that kills our selfishness. It crucifies our inordinate desires by exposing its emptiness. All that we run after, all that we obsess about is destined to die. The cross exposes that all our attempts to build our lives apart from God is like trying to live in a dead body. Right? I'll illustrate it like this way. If you get all the things right, the best you can hope for is that you die. Right? Sounds like a terrible message. <laughs> That's true. You're still going to die. You're still going to get old. You're still going to, you know, fade away. This world is not our home. Christ takes our death. And doesn't just make an illusion. It's not like, okay, then just live like this world doesn't matter. Of course this world matters. He doesn't give us an illusion. He gives us a gift. What does He give us? His life. Real life. The life of the Father. The eternal life. Resurrection life. It is given. Do you have to do anything for it? No. In fact, that's often the counseling that I have to do with new Christians. Well, what must I do? Believe. No, no. But what must I do? Well, the Bible says believe. No, no I get that. That starts. But then what must I do? Yeah, just believe. That's like the start and end of it. We don't like that, right? You know why we don't like that? Because that's like a baseball bat to you off the king post of your life, right? You have to kind of shift everything to say, you know, it doesn't matter. God's got this. I deserved worse. God has given me more than I deserve. And this act of receiving gives us life. It connects us with the life of the Father and destroys the illusion of a self-orientated world. It destroys the illusion of trying to make your world mentality. Because it reveals it was never your world to make. Right? Whose world is this? God's. And you know what? He hasn't lost control. Even when it thinks, even when it seems like it is. He never has. And he never will. I've just been going through a book recently, and it's such a fascinating idea. Jesus stands before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius, like, almost tempts him. Aren't you going to do anything? Aren't you going to say anything? Do you not know that I have the power to give or take away your life? And Jesus just responds, and he says, 
you only have the power of the one who gave it to you, being his father. So he's more guilty of your decision than you are. I mean, that's a profound statement. What was Jesus' confidence? There is nothing you can do that God hasn't planned. God has not lost control of his will. In fact, when all of evil came down on Jesus Christ, when evil did its worst and killed God, God was still in control. Now that's hard to swallow. Man, that's hard to swallow. That's hard to believe. It's hard to believe God is good when things are bad. But that's exactly what the gospel shows us. That's exactly what this is all about. You see, it is for freedom. It is this freedom, given by simple faith, that finally breaks the slavery of self-obsession. It shows us its emptiness and humiliates it through the love of the Father in Christ Jesus. What can you do in your life, church, that will ever add to God's own Son dying for you? Now you might be saying, but I've got practical needs. Well, Jesus would say, well, I've sorted out all the problems that you ever could have. You are now God's. And to quote Jesus, are you not more precious to God than a flock of sparrows, than a field of grass? Look at the grass. Look how it's dressed. Look at the flocks of birds. See how God looks after them. Are you not worth more? Trust Him. Trust Him. He's good. So what happens, church? If you find yourself in times of jealousy and rage and grumpiness and anger, well, realize you're probably making an idol in your life. It's probably you again. It's not the end. You don't need to start again. It's just a reminder that you need Jesus. That's what I love about the gospel. What if we mess up? Well, that just confirms the thesis, right? The thesis is you need a savior. Well done, you proved it. Give up on that and go back to him. Confess your sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Let go of your idols, confess them, let go of your self-building, of your world-building. Say, Lord, I'm trying to build my world. I'm sorry, I'm making an idol of myself and probably this thing I'm sorry, I need Jesus again. Repent and accept again the fact that Jesus has made you 100% right, justified. You might find yourself doing this on a daily occurrence through some, some seasons of your life. In fact, through some seasons of your life, if you're honest with yourself, you might find yourself doing this on an hourly occurrence. <laughs> Don't see that as a bad thing. I think one of the greatest dangers of Christianity is to think that we just need the cross once. We need the cross all the time. That is our life, church. That is what is building us. That is the assurance we need to take the next step by faith. To realize that it looks dark. But God still loves me. That there is still no condemnation for those who love me. Uh, love him and are called according to his purpose. This is what we need. That destroys your idols. Even the hardest one, even the worst one, the idolatry of self. So, give up on your self worship. Can I push it tonight? I don't want to beat you, but. Has it ever worked? Have you ever been satisfied and at peace? So why do we keep on going back? Let's run into the one 
who gave it all. He gave it all for sinners like me. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's what he did. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. To me, that destroys the stupidity of my own idolatry. It lays it bare. I'm not bigger than Jesus. I'm not stronger than him. I'm not more loving than him. I'm not wiser than him. So I give up and I trust and I do what's in front of me. I think that's what God's called us to. Let's pray. Lord, the, the message of the cross is simple, but it's not easy. I don't think anyone sitting here tonight would say that what they've heard is an easy message. It's a simple message. It's not difficult to understand. It's not overly complicated, but it's, it's, it's difficult to implement, Lord. And so, Lord, we realize that we are weak-faithed and weak-willed creatures. We need help. But thank you that you came into the world to save sinners, to save those who need help. You did not come to find the healthy but the sick. And you call the weak and the powerless. Lord, as we read in Ezekiel today, Lord, you don't, you don't shepherd the strong and the able. You find good pastures and you bless those who know they are weak. Help us, Lord. Help us in this, we pray. Spirit, help us in this. And may we give you all the glory as we step out in faith. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.